lovely one. Sorry about the, the audio issues. My name is Ethan Marcus. I am the Director of Communication for the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, uh, the National Sephardic Community Organization um, dedicated to preserving and promoting Sephardic Jewish cultural life and good Jewish cultural life around the country. We're so excited tonight to be partnering with Kehila Kedoshi Yanana for an amazing three part series on Greek Jew, um, called um, Meet Me in the Corner of Boom and Allen, Greek Jews on the Lower East Side of New York. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce our amazing guest, one woman who needs no introduction, but will be having a wonderful one tonight, Marsha Haddad Konomopoulos. Marsha is the, uh, currently the museum director of Kehila Kedoshi Yanana and has served since 2004 on its board of trustees. She also serves as the board of directors uh, on the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative and is the president of the Association of Friends of Greek Jewry. She was born into a traditional Sephardic Jewish family from Salonika and has devoted her life to telling the story of Greek Jewry as an author, translator, editor, and lecturer. She holds two BAs, one from Brooklyn College in Psychology and the second from Queens College in Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies, plus two masters, the first in psychiatric casework from the New School and the second in Italian from Queens College. And just a reminder, this program um, is only possible from supporters like you. And we're so grateful to have this a part of our brand new Sephardic Digital Academy initiative with many other wonderful programs on Greek, Jewish and Sephardic culture and life. This includes Sephardic history, Sephardic Torah, Sephardic community uh, initiatives, Sephardic cooking classes, Greek Jewish cooking classes, um, and host more programming. And I wanna make sure you all check out everything we have to offer at SephardicBrotherhood.com slash Sephardic Digital Academy. Now, my really great honor and privilege to introduce Marsha to uh, begin her lecture. Marsha, whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Now, what's going to happen is um, all questions will be at the end, and Ethan will be um, taking the, the questions. You can put them in uh, by writing. First of all, I would like to thank the Sephardic Brotherhood of America, Kalakadoshi Yanana, my board of trustees of KKJ, the president, Marvin Marcus, who is so supportive, his two sons, Ethan and Andrew Marcus, who always make me look good, the many members of our community who share their family treasures, photographs, and stories, and all the old and new friends I have made on this unbelievable journey. This evening, we will be taking a journey with the pioneers, those who made the arduous journey in the hulls of steamships, crossing the Atlantic to give their children the opportunities they could not have had back in Greece. Much of this text for this presentation is from my soon to be published book on Greek Jews in New York. The book is tentatively titled, Meet Me on the Corner of Broom and Allen. I wanna give a special shout out to those bearers of the flame who have helped me along my journey. Ed Kofina, who not only gave me such, such information on his own family, uh, but also arranged for an interview with Estelle Yumta. Um, I believe it was just around the time of her 100th birthday, and she was the only surviving child of Zakaria Yumta. Mildred Fruit, who has always been a source of information on the Baruch family, the Negrin family. Al Baruch, who has also arranged for an interview with his mother, Rachel uh, Colchimero Baruch, shortly before her 100th birthday and of course, the Colchimero brothers. They say whenever you write something, write about something that you know about. Well, I have been overjoyed to learn so much about the Colchimero family. How do I share my screen now with the PowerPoint, Ethan? Where is it? It's the bottom, share screen. Okay, share screen. Okay. On a relatively pleasant Saturday afternoon in July of 1905, Leon Cochimero and his wife, Julia, set foot on the shores of the United States for the first time. They were not the first Jews from Yanana, Greece, to come to New York City seeking their fortune in the new world. But in many ways, their journey, desires, and struggles exemplify the story of Greek-speaking Jews in New York City. On July 5th, 1905, Abdul Hamid II was the ruling Pasha of Yanana, and the mayor of New York was, <coughs> excuse me, Mayor McKillen. This was the world that Leon left behind. 
Although he was living in a small city of Yanina, the surrounding area of Ipiris was rarely undeveloped, mountainous, uh, quite rustic. The first pioneer to set foot in the United States from Yanina was Zakaria Yemta. On January 11th, 1899, after passing the customary health screening and being deemed suitable for entrance into the United States, Zakaria Yemtov took his first steps in the streets of New York City. He was greeted by a brutal freezing temperature of 15 degrees Fahrenheit during a particularly harsh New York winter. He was 25 years old, had $20 in his pocket, and no one to welcome him. Zakaria was the first Yanoti Jew to come to the United States. In January of 1899, January 11th, the Ottoman Turks were being challenged throughout the empire and young men were being recruited to serve in the Ottoman army. Jews were desirable since unlike Greek Orthodox Christians, they were not seeking return of land. Zakaria was able to buy his way out of the Turkish army, but as he approached the age of 25, it became very expensive. He came over in steerage in the hull of the ship. You know, we complain about some of the things we're going through now, being in quarantine. Um, it was nothing compared to what these immigrants had to go through stuffed into the hull of the ship for three weeks before they arrived at the shores of the United States. As they would approach, they would all go out on the top of the ship to look out to get a glimpse of the Statue of Liberty. Zakaria did not arrive at Ellis Island. On June 15, 1897, the wooden structures on Ellis Island were raised in a fire of unknown origin. While there were no casualties, the wooden buildings had completely burned down after two hours. Ellis Island would reopen on December 17, 1900, but not in time for Zakaria's arrival. Instead, he arrived at the barge office. He would go to 11 Madison Avenue, an old law tenement, no indoor plumbing, and two tenements built on one plot, a forward tenement and a rear tenement and an outhouse that was shared in the middle. Zakaria would in all likelihood room, he would not have a one room for himself, he would room with other immigrants, none of which he knew. He would be joined in 1902 by his wife, Mazatov Moses. Um, I'm gonna show you this picture here first. This is a picture that I have so many people to thank for because uh, it was given to me not only by um, Ed Kofina, but also by members of the Moses family. In the photo, this is Lula Moses or Lulu Moses. And, you know, they talk about how the women were subjugated to the men. They hadn't met Lulu. She was a strong woman who arranged for the marriage of most of all of her daughters and her son. There are all kinds of legends about how this took place. Supposedly her son, uh, Samuel, was betrothed to someone from the Baruch family in exchange, according to the story, that um, the matriarch of the Baruch family would give two sons for her two daughters. In this particular picture here, we have Lulu in the second, in the center. Standing on the top left is Lulu's daughter, Annie Moses Baruch. Standing top right is Lulu's daughter, Esther Moses Malach, married to a, a Sephardic Jew. And standing on the chair is Lulu's granddaughter, Leah Gannis, daughter of Julia Moises and Jacob Gannis. Standing holding Lulu's hand with a bow in her hair is Lulu's granddaughter, Florence Gannis, the daughter of Julia and Jacob. 
The boy on the bottom left holding Lulu's hand is Nathan Gannis. The other girl, Esther Yamtov, was the daughter of Mazal Tov and Zakaria Yamtov. Lulu Moses arranged marriages for her uh, son and daughters uh, with many of the pioneer Yanoki families. Her only son, Samuel, went to Constantinople and married Esther Baruch. They came to New York to join the extended family in... Okay, I'm just writing it to a little. The extended family in 1930. This is um, Sam. The name got changed, as so often happened with the Anoti Jews. The original name was Menachem Moses, or Mose, which were two male Hebrew um, first names, one of which became a surname. Actually, with Sam, he wound up being Sam Menachem rather than Sam Moses. This family, um, he was a he, uh, extraordinary man, extraordinary family. They came in 1930 to join the community here. Another part of the extension of the arrangements that uh, uh, Lulu made was with the Baruch family. And here you have Lulu later on in years with her children, Herman, Mildred, uh, Nisim Baruch, and Annie Moses, and their children, Herman, Mildred, and Lucille. I want to go back to a former slide here that I passed over. Now, what's interesting with Mazalto's journey First of all, her marriage took place in Yanida without the groom being there. They had someone stand in for Zakaria. And uh, so when she came over, she was actually listed as Mazalto um, Yamtov on the ship manifest. On the ship manifest was also her father, Menachem, and her mother-in-law. Um, certainly auspicious start to a marriage to a man that she didn't even know. Uh, this is a picture here of uh, Vlore, or uh, Avlona, in what is now Albania. And there are many of the early immigrants set from Yana set forth from that port because the, uh, it had not been dredged enough, the Corinthian Canal, for them to go out of Patras. And like many of the early immigrants, they didn't arrive in the harbor of New York. They arrived in Boston. Elias Colchimero was actually the youngest son and the first of the Colchimero brothers to arrive in the New World. He was 18 years old at the time, unencumbered by a wife and children, and he set out for New York in 1903. He had traveled with his older sister Hanula and his brother-in-law Isaac, sailing from Sherbon. He was a patriarch of a large family. You know, these families were exceedingly large, uh, eight, nine, 10, 11 children. This is a, a beautiful photo of a double wedding of two of his daughters. Um, this was not uncommon when you have so many daughters to arrange a wedding for. Why not have the both of them get married at the same time? Back in Greece, uh, they would actually very often arrange two sisters to marry two brothers because they'd have to share the family home. This is what the world that they left behind back in Yanina, the marketplace here. And the lake. You know, you can still see the clothing hanging on the lake today. This picture has not changed so much over the years. Now, Joseph Avram Negrin and Tavula Matza Negrin came over on the Graf Waldersee on July 30th, 1903. Joseph is listed as a merchant going to his friend Zakaria Yamtov. His children would marry into other Yanoti families, the Ganis, the Matza, and the Cochimero. His grandson Joseph would continue the tradition by marrying Rebecca Mioni. On July 30th, this is what he left behind. This is a street, iconic street inside the Castro. 
Vinyanana. And over here on the right is the beginning of the building of the subway system that would carry the downtown Jews uptown into Harlem. And this is what it looked like on July 30th, 1903. There were many families that would not stop on the Lower East Side, but would go directly up to Harlem and the Bronx. This is the Elias Corfino family. He arrived in 1903. And he's an excellent example of the neighborhood and occupation changes of the early immigrants. In 1910, he's living in Harlem and working as a cigarette maker. 1925, he's living on Broom Street and working in garment manufacturing. 1930, he's living in the Bronx and working in fruit, at a fruit store. And 1940, he's living uh, in the Bronx and working as a presser of artificial flowers. Whatever it took to feed your growing family. This is Sabsai Menachem, uh, who arrived on July 4th, 1904. On the ship manifest of the SS Gurdy, he's um, described He's described as a 25-year-old merchant from Turkey um, or Greece going to his brother-in-law, Joseph Negrin, at 32 Henry Street. In 1910, Menachem was living at 110 Eldridge Street in a two-room tenement apartment with his wife, Astro, four children ranging in age from seven months to nine years old, his mother, his father, three sisters, his mother-in-law and a boarder. I have a friend of mine who descends from this family and has a lovely home down on Fisher Island in Florida. And I tell her, don't have airs with me. I know where you came from. Um, Menachem worked as an apron maker and he also had his parents and two of his sisters working in the same business. July 4th, 1904, when Menachem arrived, this is what New York City looked like, and this is what Yanina looked like that he left. At 2.35 in the afternoon of October 27, 1904, New York City Mayor George McClellan takes the controls on the inaugural run of the city's innovative new rapid transit system, the subway. Many arriving Sephardic and Roman Yod immigrants went straight to Harlem. Job opportunities with the Shenazi Tobacco Company. This is some of the laying of the line you can see here. Now the Shenazi brothers were born in Kavala, in what is now Greece. Sephardic Jews who learned the fine art of cigarette making in Egypt and brought it to the New World. The story of Abraham, Abram, Naftali is a sad story. Not all stories of coming to the new world were stories of finding happy endings. Abram arrived on September 6th, 1904. On the ship manifest of the SS Gurdy, Abram is listed as going to his cousin Ezra Bakola at Chenazi Brothers at 311 West 120th Street. Many of the Greek Jews, both Sephardic and the Roman Yod, worked for the Shenazi Brothers. Abraham was killed in an accident at the New York Central Railroad overpass on East 116th Street, New York in 1906. He was riding atop a loaded truck and was killed when his head struck the overpass. His accidental death was responsible for the creation of the Good Hope Society and the United Brotherhood of Yanina. According to the death certificate from New York City Municipal Archives, the date of death is listed as May 22nd, 1906, and he is uh, buried at Mount Nebrum, Nebrum, which is right next to Mount, uh, to Mount Carmel. Now it's interesting because the legend of the Brotherhood is that when this young man died, there was no place to bury him because the Ashkenazim did not believe that he was Jewish 
with the last name of Naftali. Um, and the Sephardic Jews, the uptown Sephardic Jews, had a burial society of which he was not a member, and they did not have any place to bury him. Actually, the community did take care of Abraham, or at least Zakaria Yamtov did. They are both buried at Mount Nebon, and I am hoping once this pandemic is over that I can go there and find their graves. On October 10th, 1904, a mild autumn day in New York City, where the temperature reached a high of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, Diamantina Maza set foot in the port of New York Harbor with the destination of 311 West 120th Street, the Shenazi Brothers Tobacco Company, where her brother Leon Maza worked. This family would be, uh, provide, they would marry into the uh, Cultural Marrow family and other families, and many of their descendants are in the Kofino family, the Ashkenazi family. The story, as with so many of these fam uh, families, of marrying among each other. On the date when uh, Diamantina was coming in, October 10th, 1904, this is what a typical store back in Yanada would have looked like. And on the newspaper headlines was everything about the Slocum, where over a thousand were believed dead. This was a um, ship, a recreational ship, that uh, went down and killed all of these poor people. The church that they belonged to, which was a Lutheran church, became the uh, site for the community synagogue in East, the East Village. Joseph Bacola arrived in New York on May 11th, 1905. This is one of the stories that I'm researching with the Bacola family. And I've tried to, any of you who have been following what I'm doing on Facebook, I'm trying to find more of the Bacola family trees in a particular search where I'm looking for descendants for a young man who lives in, outside of Manchester in England. Morris uh, Bekaraki Jini arrived June 23rd, 1907. His wife Fanny would join him in 1908 and his father Abraham in 1910. Give me one second here. This is a Bekoraki uh, Janice Sanhai would serve Kehalaka Doshiyana for over 40 years. This is Hyde's bar mitzvah picture, and this is his wedding picture to his lovely wife, Lil. Um, on that same ship, arriving in New York on June 23rd, 1907, was another Bekaraki, Abraham Mayoni, age 23, heading to the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Abraham's grandson, Jerry Pardo, is on our board of directors, and Hyde Janice uh, and then Abraham Bekoraki, Janice's grandchildren, Lois and Marty Ledner are also on our board. It always stirs me when I see these families sitting together and realizing they were on the same ship coming over. Jesula Menachem, was um, arrived on June 6, 1907. And he was a, um, a leading figure in the creation of the synagogue. In fact, on the entrance in the vestibule, his name is there, along with some of the other board of directors in 1907, Leon Cochimero. This plaque is very interesting. Leon Cochimero is listed as a rabbi. He was never a rabbi. At one point, it was scratched out and another point put back in. Um, Joseph, Joseph, of course, was president and Elias of Solomon, vice president. Epstein very often appears in the records as Epstein, but Epstein was a name in Yanina. Um, Aliyah Maza, Matza, uh, Samuel Nachum, 
Yeshua Menachem, Solomon Asser, and we'll be talking about his family shortly, Morris Besso, Elias Asser, Jesula Levy, the rabbi, and Jesula Mizan, honorary president, Elias de Castro, honorary secretary, Aaron Sedek, honorary secretary. There was another name on the bottom here that was scratched off, so evidently somebody didn't pay their money. This here is a lovely photo. of uh, the Yohanan family that arrived in 1907. And uh, this photo here shows the dedication of a Torah scroll by Joseph Yohanan. And many members of his family he had three daughters and each of them had one child and they were all very much a part of the story of the synagogue on the Lower East Side. Joseph Politis came to the United States in 1908, and his future wife, Esther Joseph, would come in 1905. I'm putting this up here, though it's very, very hard to read. Um, those of you who do genealogical research will particularly look to try to find this form on um, Ancestry is the best place. This is a form that is filled out by the immigrants where they pledge their declaration of intention to become a citizen of the United States. This one is from Zeta Cofino, who arrived May 13, 1909. This form will show you what date he arrived, the ship he arrived on, uh, which is always important to try to get the ship manifest, and then uh, uh, what his family was like at the time he was declaring his for his citizenship, his wife and his children. And they, al they always had to um, forfeit their allegiance to their former country, whether it be the Sultan of the Ottoman Turkish Empire or the uh, King of Greece. On May 13, 1909, when Joseph arrived, I put this picture up here because, you know, when we talk about certain families, this picture on the right was a wedding in Yanina. Some of the families that came over were so large that they probably could have duplicated this photo here in the New World. Most of them had at least seven, eight, nine children married into a family where they also had large number of children. I mean, the, the um, Jasula and Rachel Colchomero had 11 children. This here is a picture from someone from the Cofino family in a modern wedding gown. Back in Greece, the bride did not wear white. Here in the New World, these beautiful gowns were always rented. They were not bought. The gown that they would get married in, if they brought it from the old world, we have a number of them hanging in our synagogue, were beautiful, handmade, only worn once, and then packed away very carefully, and very often made the journey to the new world. Solomon Ovaja arrived on May 26, 1909. As Solomon pulled into the port of New York on the SS Alice, he was greeted by showers and seasonal temperatures. On page three of the Daily Tribune, possible resolution of the strike of the white firefighters, there's no attempt at being politically correct here, may succeed in getting the Georgia Railroad up and running. King George was the king of Greece at that time. He would be assassinated four years later in 1913 during the Second Balkan War. And Teddy Roosevelt was president of the United States. The family name went through various incarnations from Ovaja to Solomon. And this was not uncommon. Um, since most Roman Yote, Yanina Jews, had first male Hebrew first names as surnames. Uh, very often, especially in the archives, this would be switched around. 
Samuel would have a son, he'd name him Solomon after his father. And when Solomon had a son, he would name him Samuel after his father. And the Ottoman Turks decided, they thought that the Jews were changing their surname from generation to generation. So they said, that's it. You have to all have the same surname. Of course, they went on naming as they always did. I did not realize what was actually happening until I got my hands on uh, Rabbi Bekoraki Machil's uh, circumcision list that he had beautifully written it in the back of a prayer book. Of over 600 uh, young boys, he circumcised both in Yanina and then after he came to the United States. He wrote the boys' names down the way a Jewish man would give his son's name for the Brit Milah. He first would give his name, then his father's name, and then his son's name. When the person in the archives was hearing this, very often the names would get confused because they were all, most of them were all male Hebrew first names. This is the picture on the right of 1901, before the building of the Williamsburg Bridge and when it was completed in 1904. The building of the bridge caused a whole exodus from the Lower East Side to Williamsburg and the beginning of a new community of Yanoti Jews in Williamsburg. One of the families there was the Solomon Asser family that, um, came on July 13th, 1909. When the SS Alice pulled into the port of New York, the haze around the July 13th sun obscured the view of the Statue of Liberty. A tropical storm was brewing in the Southern Atlantic, but it would be days before rain would bring a brief respite to the unrelenting New York summer heat. On board the SS Alice was 20-year-old Solomon Asser, a literate laborer going to his friend at Negrin and Company at 26 St. Mark's Place. Other members of the Asser family would begin to arrive, including Rabbi Simon Asser. The family would become part of the growing Yanoti Enclave in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. On July 13, 1909, there were and, and on, in Crete, there was an, quite a uh, unfortunate instance between the Turks and the Greeks, and many Greeks died. It caused a regeneration of patriotism. Everybody was looking to no longer be part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. While in New York, this picture you're looking at here would eventually become the site of the Twin Towers. Uh, these were the buildings that were down there before the Twin Towers were built and what you would be able to see on July 13th, 1909. On um, February 12th, 1910, Joseph and Esther Askenazi, along with uh, five of their six children, stepped off their ship into the port of New York. I am still waiting for additional photographs from the Askenazi family to enable us to do, they are sponsoring the next e-newsletter and um, hopefully we'll be, you know, I'm hoping with this presentation, you guys will see the wealth of photographs I have. And if your family photographs are not here, give them to me, please, so that we can include them and use them to educate the world on what Romano Jewry was about. As the threat of war in the Balkans became more imminent, the Jews of Vienna began to leave in greater numbers. An example of this was the ship manifest of the SS Mark of Washington that arrived in the port of New York on June 12, 1911. On board were 46 Romano Jews from Yanina and nearby communities. Among them were members of the Baruch, Batuli, Saba, Ashkenazi, Purito, Addis, Kulius, Israel, Benjamin, Nachman, Petrillo, which by the way, the actual name was Pizzarillo, Levi, Naftali, Abraham, Yamtab, Moses, Matzah, Sarita, Kolonimos, Isaac, Hametz, Ishakis, Tepelin, Malay, Kohn, and Matzo families. It sounds like a roll call of the Pashas. 
all had relatives or friends that they would be joining in New York, some venturing up to Harlem to join family there, but most settling on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. This was what, what was going on as that ship pulled into port on June 12, 1911. Back in Yana, a marketplace in the center of the city. And the streets of New York were quite different. I often wonder what was going through the minds of these immigrants as they stepped off the ship. Most of them came from this insular world, surrounded by family. Most of them had never left Yanina. First would be the ex experience of being on board a boat where they would hear so many different languages. They would meet Jews that were so different from them as Jews came in from Trieste, Ashkenazi Jews, before, because that would be the uh, port that the boat would leave from before it stopped in Patras. Then they would step off the boat into New York City and what a different world it was, so different from the world they had left behind. Hyman Baruch and his sons, Benjamin, were among those on the Martha Washington. The Baruchs would marry into other prominent Romano families, the Moses, Menachem, Kofina, Colchimero, Negrin, Solomon, and David. This is another lovely picture of Lula over here with a part of her extended family. The Morris Vatulis family and the Jacob Corito families. The Vatulis family um, I've got to know quite well over the past couple of uh, months because of um, Sarah Crocker, whose mother is in this picture. If I'm not mistaken, her mother is the little girl over here. And this is Evelyn, her sister and then their brother, Sam, in the middle. The Carito family I've known for many, many years. Dave Carito, who lives down in Florida, came to Greece with me many years ago. I love the little old women, you know? When I was living in Santorini, let me tell you, those little old women, they would be able to find a seat on the bus when nobody else could. And they would be in the front of the line in the grocery store. There was one time my bus stopped just to let one of these little old women out to deliver something. And all of us sat in the hot sweltering bus for 20 minutes until she returned. This is the Nisim Addis and the Samuel Petrillo families. There were a number of Addis families and um, Barry Mionis is compiling a master Addis family tree. I want to at this point, since I mentioned Barry's name, thank him and all the work he has done on DNA research, along with Adam uh, Brown and Jonathan Alcantara, uh, we've been able to compile quite a, a database of Romano DNA, and the connections that have been made have been phenomenal. This is the uh, Petrillo family here, Samuel Petrillo, and this actually came from a member of the Solomon family, and if I'm not mistaken, this woman over here is a Solomon. Mordecai Moses and Simon Abraham families. This here, Mordecai Moses, this family has been photoshopped. You know, uh, these, this community was very adept at photoshopping very early on. Um, Malka had passed away and she was photoshopped to be in a photo with her husband, Mordecai. Um, her son went to fight in World War I and when he came back, to the Lower East Side, there, his family was not living in the apartment in the tenement building. And that's how he learned of his mother's death. Um, they, this family uh, also married out into many other Yanoti families, especially the Baron family. And this is the Simon Abraham family. I got this from Megha Berlides. And this is her part of the family over here, who came early to the United States, although May's husband Zeno did not come until after World War II. Zedek Batino arrived on June 8, 1912. 22-year-old Zedek <clears throat> and his 23-year-old sister Esther, let me just get some water here. Stepped off their steamship into the port of New York City 
and they were welcomed by a pleasant day as they made their way uptown to 32.34 West 100th Street and their cousin Chaim Angelo Raphael. Zadig's uptown Harlem stay would be temporary as he would shortly marry Anna de Castro and start their family on the Lower East Side before moving to Cortona Boulevard in the Bronx. Uh, Ralphie Bottino was one of my favorite people and he died just short of his 100th birthday two years ago. Um, an exceptional person, a, a true Pasha. And I, we were so fortunate, um, Marvin, myself, Rose Eskenaz, to visit him and all go out, of course, to a Greek restaurant for lunch. When Zedek Batino came into the United States on June 8, 1912, things were boiling in the Balkans. The first Balkan war had already started and soon Yanina would be swept up into the second Balkan war. Meanwhile, back in the United States, the, um, the 10th anniversary of the Century Line, which was advertised as the world record for continuing long distance train service. You could actually sleep on the train. Uh, that was being advertised in the local New York papers. I'm gonna to touch now on Sephardim on the Lower East Side. I want to um, put forth a disclaimer here because most of this presentation is about the Romano Jews. I feel an obligation to them as a museum director, but I want to include the Sephardim also in this presentation because their stories in many instances are very much entwined with ours. Over here on the left, it's a beautiful wedding picture of Vinnie and Shirley Pinto Madragona. Uh, and this is actually Marvin Marcus's cousin, Shirley or Sarah. And this is the Abelafia family that married into the, with, to the Culture Marrow family. There were also Sephardic organizations on the Lower East Side, including the Brotherhood of Rose and the Monast Elise Society. You know, brotherhoods were founded before synagogues were. It was incumbent on Jews to uh, find a proper burial for their brethren who died, where you could practice your religion with a sedor and a minion, but you needed people to organize burials. So burial societies often preceded the creation of a synagogue. Here we have some other Sephardic families on the Lower East Side. The Atun family, uh, the family of my, my good friend, uh, Louise, who um, actually had her great-grandfather was the last rabbi in uh, Kavala before the Bulgarians deported him to Treblinka. And this uh, part of her family, the Atun family, had come to the United States here. And this is a picture of the children from the Casola family who had a store on the Lower East Side. This picture here is from the Hamki family, also part of the Lower East Side. And this is Mordecai, the Mordecai family, who actually were Marcus when they came to the United States. They came from Verlier much the same way as our president Marvin Marcus did. And Marco was a nickname for Mordecai. And during immigration, they became Marcus. At this point, let me repeat that, uh, don't blame Ellis Island for changes in names. All the names they took were directly off the ship manifest. Here you have the Confino family of uh, the Tenement Museum, which of course also were very much a part of the Lower East Side. They did not come actually until 1913. And this is Hank Hallio, Joe Hallio's father, who the family was very much involved in publication of the Ladino Press. Um, these are members of the Sephardic world that actually are family of members of our board of trustees. Here's our president, Marvin Marcus, charming in his bar mitzvah picture. And this is the family of Rose Eskenaz here. This is her mother, Dora, and her father, Solomon. Um, Dora was from the Marash family and Solomon uh, was from the Capone family. 
And this little cutie is me. Um, this is, uh, I, I look like a very underfed child, but um, this is my picture. I also came from the Sephardic world. My family came over to the United States in 1945. My mother smuggled me in in her stomach. I want to end this with a photo from the entranceway, the vestibule of our synagogue, and to give thanks again to all of you who tuned in, to my board of trustees, to our congregation, which I am so honored to be accepted by. And I want to thank you. Tune in for part two, which is going to be called The Second Coming. I thought that was appropriate. And um, now, Ethan, are you there? I'm going to open up the floor to questions, OK? Indeed, I am. Thank you so much, Marcia, for You're a wonderful first presentation, um, both, uh, both on Kehillah Koshiana, the only Greek Roman on synagogue in Western Hemisphere, and my and I have to say my home synagogue as well. My, I myself was both bar mitzvahed and had my brit milah there. Um, so I've been involved a bit as well. Um, so we're gonna open up to questions. If anybody would like to ask a question, please enter them into the chat and we'll read them out. Um, and you just click by clicking chat and opening up and I'll read it out for you one at a time. I'll first open up with a question um, from my end. I'm curious, Marsha, how the Roman Jews at the turn of the century when they came to the Lower East Side and the Sephardim interacted um, in the early teens and 20s and then later into the 40s and 50s in relation to the Ashkenazic Jews who were much more dominant and much more prevalent in the society. Okay, actually the Romano Jews uh, were, of course, they were not thought to be Jewish by the Ashkenazim and neither were the Sephardic Jews. But the Sephardim really looked down on the Romano community much in the same way as they had looked down upon them in Greece. Uh, they felt the Romanos to be inferior, not as learned, uh, every, you know, the, the Sephardim came with learned rabbis when they came to Greece. You know, the irony of it is they're all gone and we're still there. So um, I often attribute it to the fact of not only being stubborn Greeks, but they were very proud of who they were. Uh, they may not have been learned as some of their Sephardic neighbors, but none of these immigrants were really learned. Um, the Balkan Jews were considered riffraff by the uptown Sephardim, where they came in and did the right thing and opened up a Talmud Torah on Eldridge Street and tried to do the best for the incoming Jews from the Balkans. They really wanted them to stay downtown and not come uptown and embarrass them. But um, on the Lower East Side, this little community was very outside the box. And they, I think that helped perpetuate them because they couldn't, they couldn't merge with any other synagogue. Their liturgy and everything was very distinct. I hope I answered that, Ethan. Okay. No, I think that was helpful. Okay. Um, so another question here from Rhonda. How many people were living in Yadana from 1899 to 1930? And then how many were left who did not immigrate to the U.S.? Okay, how many were living in Yadana? Um, it's estimated that the population at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century was approximately four to 5,000. And uh, most of these were probably uh, from 400 families. Everybody was related either by blood or by marriage. At the time of World War II, the population was 2,000. So half the Jewish community of Canada emigrated some of them went to Israel very early on. There was a strong Zionist movement. Some of them went to other places in Europe. The greater majority of them came to the United States between in those years. Um, we had, it's estimated at Kehala when we opened up our doors, probably close to 400 families that belonged to the, um, the synagogue. In fact, at the high holidays, it was so packed that if you didn't buy your seat, we sold seats then, it was the only time we ever did, but it was really crowd control rather than to raise money. If you didn't buy your seat, you had to walk over the Williamsburg Bridge and pray to make shift synagogue there. Just to clarify, Marsha, you were referring to the, pop the Jewish population out of the, the Christian was about 20,000, correct? Uh, well, the Jews were about, in Yonin, at the time of um, the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, they were about 
five to six percent of the total population. So do the math. Okay. I can't. I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> um, did the local Greek Jews on the Lower East Side have any relationship with the Greek Christian New Yorkers? Yes, definitely. In fact, there was a Kafanian on Allen Street, two Kafanians right next door to each other. And that's where both the Greek Jews and the Greek Orthodox Christians would hang out. Uh, they shared language. You know, where the Sephardim uh, had their own newspapers and they would sit in their own uh, cafe uh, coffee shops. The uh, Roman Jews shared a lot with their Greek Orthodox Christians. They lived in the same buildings. They, uh, we had a Greek Orthodox church, St. Barbara's, not too far away from us. And the buildings, if you look at the census records, there were many Greek Orthodox that were living. Language was the binding factor in this case. Another question here from Joseph. Uh, did the Yanyot Jews have their own prayer books? The, okay, back in Yanina, after the incoming of the Sephardim into Salonika, and when Salonika started to print the prayer books uh, in Greece, the um, particular prayer books for the Yanoti Jews were no longer being published. Uh, what we do have in our collection are two books that are in judeo greco two Sidorim that are upstairs in our new exhibit uh, that they brought with them from, uh, from Yanina when they came here. And they're handwritten. They're not printed books. Uh, the actual Roman Yod prayer book, there is a copy at the Sheba University, and uh, we're trying to arrange to get it back into print again. A question here from Arthur. How fluid was the lifestyle between the Jewish communities um, of Yanana and others like Monastir? Okay, I didn't hear the beginning of the question. Sorry, the question was how um, fluid or interconnected were the lifestyles between the Jewish communities of Yanana and other Sephardic communities like Monastir? Were the life? Well, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not how, how connected were these communities like Yanana, okay. Monastir, Izmir, other, other Balkan communities? Okay. Um, they weren't really connected. There were separate enclaves on the Lower East Side. Uh, the monasteries had their synagogue on Elder Street. We had ours on Broom Street. After they closed their doors, we had many monasteries that came to worship with us. But their right was very different. Their minhag was very different. Their use of Ladino was, was uh, not what would be happening in Kehelika Dosianura. With the closing of the monastery synagogue and them coming to worship with us, we now incorporate into our services uh, some things from the Sephardic world. But at the time that the synagogues were open, there really was very little interaction. And, you know, this was, they were very, uh, even in Brooklyn, where uh, over in um, New Lot, where my family went to worship at the Monastery Synagogue there, because my great grandfather was from Monastery, you had. I think four separate synagogues that were all Sephardic from the Ottoman Empire. There was the Ankalis, there was the Monasteris, there was the Kaskodalis, and I forgot what the other one was. And that's it. You went where your family went. And uh, this was very typical of the Sephardic world. We did not have the luxury amongst the Roman Jews on the Lower East Side. We were the only game in town. We were the only ones. And where we moved into Brooklyn and the, um, and the Bronx and, you know, uh, Harlem and then the Bronx, um, they were each in those instances only one synagogue in existence, one in Brooklyn, one in the Bronx, one downtown. But um, it, it was a very tiny community. It was a minority within a minority within a minority. Marcia, can you comment on the relationships between the communities in the old country, between Yanana and, and Monastir, like the old actual local communities there? Okay, well, with, between Yanana and Monastir, there was very little communication. Between Monastir, there was communication in, with Salonika and with Castoria. Um, but uh, being Roman Yoke, being Greek speaking, um, and being on the other side of the Pindos mountain range, sort of set up not only a linguistic barrier, but also a physical barrier between the intermingling of those communities. There was one family, the Colonimos, that came from Yanana and went up to Monastir. I'm not sure for what reason, and they were definitely Roman Jews, but that was a rarity. Um, there really was not that intermingling between the Roman and the Sephardim. I think I repeated this at a formal lecture, 
but in Ray Dalvin expressed it beautifully. She said, God protect us from the Christians of Arta, the Turks of Yanda, and the Jews of Salavica. And that was really the feeling. There was no love lost between the groups there. Now, one question here from Alex, that looking at a lot of the photos, you can notice that there's a, a different clothing styles worn between men and women of these families. And he's curious, how quickly did the Yanyot immigrants uh, usually pick up and adopt American Western style fashion after immigrating? Okay, well, um, those especially that worked in the clothing industry adopted Western style. They were out in the world. The men were working outside. The women also, um, they would uh, dress very simply. They were certainly not fashion icons in their dress. They um, didn't, they no longer wore where they took their costumes with them from the old world. They didn't wear it in, in the United States. Uh, they were very modest. Uh, one of the biggest industries amongst the um, Roman Yote Jews was house dress, uh, dresses. I don't think anyone wears house dresses anymore. They called them kimonas, and that was a very big industry. But um, they certainly adopted the Western style. And with the next generation, as their children grew up, they adopted it even more. That's when the conflict of generations set in, not only on dress style, but on values, edu desire for education from the young people, where in the, uh, among the older people, the young boys would go to work in the family business. They didn't go on to college. And for the women, it was unheard of to go to college. So there was the conflict there between the generations. A question here from Tina. Is it true that the records from Yadana were destroyed in a fire? No, um, they were not. The records from Salonika were destroyed in a fire. The fire of 1917 destroyed those records. Uh, Yadana, we have municipal records. In fact, my computer is the um, guardian of the municipal archives of Yadana we uh, translated most of the birth records uh, from Yana. So if any of you want information on your families, do get in touch with me. I have most of that information. I don't put it out there for a number of reasons, um, because if you looked at it, you'd co come back screaming at me and you say, these are all mistakes. Because a lot of the names are entered where there's a mix up in first, and, uh, first name and surname. I've shared them with certain people so that I'm not the only bearer of these archives. But I have the ma uh, male registry, the female registry, and then I have a list of, from the census, I believe of 1936, where I did cross reference on that. I also, of course, have the Holocaust records. And then I have a list of occupations of uh, Jews who were part of major occupations in Yanada, and I believe that was during the 1930s also. Again, if you want anything, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Um, we're gonna wrap up in just a few minutes. So I'll just ask a few other questions. Um, and I apologize if we don't get to all your questions, feel free to uh, email Marsha directly. We're gonna post her email museum at kkjsm.org into the chat. So you can feel free to email her as well. Um, one another question we have here is, how many Romagnote Jews would you, would you estimate today in the US identify as Romagnote? Okay, difficult question. Um, the number, okay, we have on our mailing list about 3,500 throughout the United States where there is someone there who has a Roman yoke connection. Uh, first generation, um, we are really on our board, we're very fortunate. The Colter Mero brothers are Roman yoke on both sides of the family. Um, we have Salkafinus, again, Roman yoke on both sides of the family. Uh, but um, this is not the case with most Roman Yo Jews. Most of them, would, especially in the second generation after coming over, their children would marry out. They would marry um, Sephardic Jews very often, Ashkenazi Jews, Hara of Oharas. And then they, um, so, you know, it's a strong, very seductive culture. And if you go to the children, how they identify themselves, I find fascinating because they may only have one grandparent that's of Greek Jewish background, Roman Yote or Sephardic, and they will identify with that culture. I think a lot of it has to do with how strong their feelings are about this small little community. I know on my trips, 
90% of my participants descend from Romano Jews and the longing to return to where their families came from. I'm seeing Sarah Naftali up there. Sarah was with me in Greece. How you doing, Sarah? And um, I think twice. But, uh, you know, it's, um, I don't think the same feeling exists amongst Ashkenazi Jews. I mean, most of them, if they do go back to trace their roots, they'll go back and they'll say, well, thank God we got out and, you know, no great, no great longing. I often say when immigrants pack their baggage, they not only pack their clothing, their artifacts, if they have photographs, they also pack their emotional baggage. And for especially Roman young Jews, that emotional baggage included a love of the world that they were leaving behind, a love that they passed on to their children. The number of times I've gone with to Yanina and I've had one of my participants say, I can't wait to jump into the lake. My grandmother used to talk how she washed the clothing in the lake. Well, you're not gonna jump into the lake. Now it's really quite polluted. But this is the type of feelings that they have. I've had Yanina Jews, when they get off the plane, literally bend down and kiss the ground the same way Jews would when they go to Israel. This is the emotional feeling of physically being there. And one of the most beautiful things that I found that I do on my trip is we print out photographs of their relatives so that they walk into the synagogue of Yanina. They're carrying their family with them. They're carrying the family who made the journey so that they could return and they could visit. I think we have time for just two more questions here. Okay. So the first one here. Um, when did the Romagnotes uh, on the Lower East Side start identifying themselves not as Sephardic, but as uniquely Romagnote? Okay, this was when Ray Dalvin wrote her book, The Jews of Yanina, because before that they thought they were all Sephardic. And Elliot Colchamaro expressed this beautifully when he said, I thought I was Sephardic. And then I wondered why. We didn't speak Spanish, we spoke Greek. And then there was that realization that. Uh, that moment when they realized that they were different. So that was after no one. They, didn't even, they had never heard of the term Roman yoke. They called themselves Yanotis or uh, Kofiotis. That was from the location that they came from. But it was because of Ray Dalvin's writing that that changed. I want to take one last question here. Um, a really apt question. If you're, if you're Roman yoke, uh, who knows very little about their personal culture or heritage, how, do you rec how would you recommend learning more? Get in touch with us. I mean, very, we're very open. Uh, ask us questions. We'll suggest books to read. If you live in the area, we'd love you to attend services and join us once we're able to have services again. There are so many great programs. I mean, you can tune in for a Friday night Kabbalah Shabbat service now on Zoom with Chaim Kofinis. You can hear Rabbi Negrin from Athens with also a Kabbalah Shabbat service. We have Habdalah services with Rabbi Nisim El Nakaveh. There's so much Zoom, if anything, I think has opened up a whole new world for us. And I think after we're past this pandemic, we're gonna be better for it because of what we've learned during the interim. But certainly if you are Romeo and you know nothing about your background, come to us, okay? Wonderful. With that, I just want to keep mindful of time. I want to first again thank Marsha so much for this wonderful first lecture in our three-part series. And again, be sure to join us next Monday at 8 p.m. for part two and invite all your friends and tell them about it. We'd love to have them together. And just a reminder, feel free to email us as well with any questions. I'm just writing right now Marsha's email, museum at kdjsm.org, into the chat. So if you have any personal questions for her that we didn't have a chance to get to this evening, unfortunately, feel free to email her. I'm sure she'd be more than happy to, uh, to answer any of them and, and get in touch with you. Um, thank you all again so much for joining us this evening. Um, this, once again, this project is sponsored by the Sephardic Jewish Brother, along with Kehila Kadosh through our new Sephardic Digital Academy. If you have any ideas, if you're ever interested in sponsoring a class or a series, we do rely on your support to make these things possible please feel to reach out to us at info at sephardicbrotherhood.com. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you, Ethan.